weit Chapel, mein weit Chapel, der kennen kenn ich die nicht mehr, die bis gewöhnt dem Londrinens Glanz. Weit Chapel, mein weit Chapel, in die Eugen fällt Verträge, blieben ist kein Winkel, kein Ganz. Der Pavillon mit seinem Pracht verlegt du keiner jeder Nacht, du hast gewohnt, der Lockschen Fabrikant. Und du gestanden ist die Schiele, nächste Haft, die Jelly Deals, sie ist jeder Spann, mir lieben, geht bekannt. In fünf Pavillons linker Hand sehe ich Land aus Restaurant. Aktoren schreiben es bei jedem Tisch. Gewähne sa Fresserne ja dort, a Kibitzerne als Favorite auch. Mir liegt in Tarn noch die gefüllte Fisch. Thank you, Demi. A very, very warm welcome to everyone here um, at Manchester's Jewish Museum. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this event in collaboration with the Manchester Poetry Library at Manchester Metropolitan University and the Writing School and many, many other individuals connected to the late poet Avram Nochum Stenzel, including his great niece Miriam, uh, Becca, who is a Manchester resident, and it's a special warm welcome to you, Miriam, and to you, Roy. Um, you'll hear from Miriam a bit later on in the night. My name is Rachel Lichtenstein. I'm a writer and an artist um, who also works as a reader in the English department of Manchester Metropolitan University. For me, this event probably means more than any other, it's the culmination of over 30 years of ongoing research, which we, you will hear more about during this evening's proceedings. But just to let you know, I first heard stories about Stenzel um, in my childhood from my father, and his stories of his literary circles and his poetry inspired me to become an artist, inspired me to move to the East End. So tonight, despite being such a very, very sad night, is a celebration of Yiddish, of the life and the work of this late Yiddish poet, of his lively Yiddish Saturday afternoon literary meetings, which he held for many years, um, from the time that he arrived 
in uh, the UK in 1936 as a stateless refugee from Nazi Germany until he died in the 1980s. And these meetings continued on and actually became the longest running literary meetings in the UK. They continued until after his death, until 2011. And Vivi, who you'll hear from later, will can tell you a bit more about the contemporary Yiddish story. So during this event, this uh, multidisciplinary, multicultural event, you'll hear some clips from a forthcoming radio programme about stencil. See the screening of a specially commissioned short film that was commissioned by the Manchester Poetry Library and produced during lockdown under quite difficult circumstances, but we managed to speak to so many people over Zoom all around the world and gather their stories. And following that, you will hear readings of Stenzel's poetry in Yiddish and in English by Stephen Watts and Vivi Lax. And Vivi will also be uh, reading from her book London Yiddish Town and bringing some song, uh, some interactive song, I think, uh, into this amazing space of the restored synagogue. Um, and if any of you haven't been here before, please do come back and have a look around this incredible Jewish museum. Um, so before we start, I just want to publicly thank the many people that have made this work possible, including Miriam. Um, Miriam allowed me access to the stencil archives, which are situated in SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in Bloomsbury. And I first contacted Miriam maybe 15, 20 years ago to get access to the archive, and you'll see some of those images um, in the exhibition, in the foyer. But this archive itself would not have been made, would not exist without the tremendous effort of two of Stenzel's friends and, and supporters. The Yiddish scholar and teacher, Dovid Katz, who was going to be here tonight, who's sadly un unable to join us and hopefully will in future events. I'm immensely grateful to Dovid for his continuous efforts to support the work of Stenzel and other Yiddish writers to bring that work to light and his tremendous support to me personally with this research. I also want to thank the late Bill Fishman, who was known to a number of people here um, and has been a great inspiration for me. You'll see uh, a, a video clip of Bill in the film. Bill and Dovid physically saved Stenzel's archive and deposited it at SOAS. And this is an important story to tell because without the work of these people, there wouldn't be any material for future researchers like myself to look at. And importantly, Bill Fishman was also great friends with the late Bill Williams, who formerly ran the history department at Manchester Metropolitan University back when it was a polytechnic and he started collecting and gathering oral histories of the Jewish community. And I've been working with Ross Levishin recently on another collaborative pro project, mapping those stories. But Bill Fishman, when I met him in the early 1990s in London, told me about the tremendous work that this non-Jewish social historian, Bill Williams, was conducting here in Manchester which eventually led, along with many others, to the establishment of uh, the Jewish Museum. So I think it's a lovely full circle um, st story, and I'd like to particularly thank the Manchester Poetry Library, the university, but particularly the, everyone here at the museum for hosting this event. And I also want to thank the folklorist Derek Reed, whose voice you're going to hear very soon. Derek is very much here in spirit. He knew Stenzel in the 1960s. He grew up speaking Yiddish, and he recorded him speaking Yiddish. And now we're going to hear a very rare clip 
from a radio program from the 1960s, which is part of a longer radio program. Patrick Bernard is here from Resonance FM, and he's put together this wonderful one-hour documentary, uh, which will be aired later in the year. So, in a moment, we're going to play this clip, which includes the voice of Derek, his recordings of Stenzel before he died, reading his poems, as well as readings in English and Yiddish by Dr. Bruria Weingard, who, along with Stephen Watts, has translated much of Stenzel's poetry. It feels really important to me to bring Stenzel and these other people into the room in this way, particularly at the beginning of the evening. And this was the tradition of the Friends of Yiddish literary meetings. After Stenzel died, uh, the chairman who took over from him, Maya Bogdansky, would always start by reading a poem of Stenzel's. So that's what I'd like to do now. So please listen and enjoy. And now, heritage. This week, folklorist Derek Reed looks back on the growth of Whitechapel's Jewish community. Whitechapel, Yerushalayim, the word Compedice, Cordova, Kronke, Amsterdam, Lublin, Borogin, Wilder, Sardisha, Kukosk, Shelmal, the Victor's life, the Eindepensein, with our Pashnike, Sejitomir, and Plot. Reading in its original Yiddish, his poem, Whitechapel in Britain, the voice you heard there belongs to Abraham Nachum Stencil, the 80-year-old Jewish folk poet of London's East End. Folk poet because, by his own admission, Stencil has never felt it necessary to extend himself beyond the bounds of Ashkenazi tradition and the language and life of its heritage. Stencil himself arrived in Whitechapel long after the community's establishment. You can gather his background from the list of towns he refers to in the first verse. Plumbedita, Cordova, Krakow, Amsterdam, and the rest. These were all places where great Jewish schools of rabbinic learning were established. And he is, in fact, the son and brother of rabbis. But his own interest lay in the culture of the people. By chapel By chapel idelia. Finstere heufler, Dark little courtyards and shadowed and dark reflected in Shabbos calm the whole week long. Each tiny street is a lit up bridge like this. We'll go across it happily toward the Messiah. Our own heaven weaving itself onto the street with Kedusha and Boho and then Amen, accompanied by the joy song of the sewing feet, its three seamstresses and its dear little son. And if, God forbid, we'd run away from home, like a needed Städte, we'd take you off with us, as if from Poland, Lithuania, you, Whitechapel, I rhythm sense the run rhyme move my feet. From the charnel pit as an unextinguished spark, a little Shabbos candle leaves the house from here. We we'll carry it somewhere far off with bare hands and bring it home before it dies wholly down. Thank you very much. Um, we're now shortly going to see a short experimental film, The Commission for the Poetry Library, uh, which was made during the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021 by myself and director Andy Delaney, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, with many other contributors. Um, there's so many different sources in this film, including shots of Stenzel himself from a very rare documentary called Belonging, which was made um, for the BBC in the 1960s by a filmmaker, a Hungarian refugee called Robert Vass. Some of the voices in the film, such as Bill Fishman and Maya Bogdansky, who I mentioned before, 
are no longer with us. The film opens, it's narrated by me, um, talking about this place called Whitechapel, which will come up again in Stenzel's poems. For those that don't know this place, it's a district, a poor district in the East End of London, where Stenzel lived and worked from the time he arrived in the UK in 1936 until he died in 1983. It's the place where my own Polish Jewish grandparents met, married and settled after they also came as uh, immigrants to London. It's the place where my father was born, where I myself lived for many years and where the poet Stephen Watts still lives now. And I think if Whitechapel were to be twinned with any other place in the UK, it would be Cheatham Hill here in Manchester. There's a very special connection between these two places. Both are richly diverse cultural areas outside the boundaries of, of the main city, which were once home to Jewish communities from all over the world and have since become home to many other immigrant communities from around the globe. I know Stenzel would have absolutely loved this place. Um, let's play the film. I moved to Whitechapel nearly 30 years ago, searching for the remnants of this lost world. Former residents describe the area as once bursting with life, with its Jewish markets and theatres, cinemas and dance halls. Um, he used to wear always suits, always shirt and tie, and a big coat with very big pockets. He, he would literally walk around so that people could see it, and they would go, oh, what, what's that, what's that? Oh, yes, 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 yes it is, please. His appearance and the sound of his voice reminded people of the old world they had left behind. His dedication to the preservation of Yiddish made him a legend. The continuity of the Yiddish language became his personal mission. My father remembers seeing Stenzel on many occasions at the family home in Westcliff or Whitechapel on Sea, as many called it. That's where the Lichtensteins moved from the bombed out streets of East London after the war. Their seaside home became a refuge and a meeting place for the artists, poets and radicals of the Jewish East End, and Stenzel was their undoubted leader. My father said he was like a warm and affectionate uncle who pinches cheeks vigorously and speak to him at great speed in Yiddish. The classic East European tradition, Stenzel inspired simple working people, mostly tailors, to love literature, to read literature, to recite literature, to even try to write. My grandfather, Gedalia Lichtenstein, had been a regular attendee of the Friends of Yiddish, the weekly literary Saturday afternoon meetings, which Stenzel had established in Whitechapel soon after his arrival in London in 1936. When I came there, I had to stand by the wall. And then Stenzel told me he put down 250 chairs and people had to stand by the wall. It was thrilling to see somebody with such charisma whose entire love in life was for the Yiddish language without wanting money or position or fancy clothes, um, but wanting to be the guru of his little circle. Over time, my fascination with Stenzel grew. His story is this story in microcosm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I must say, for me, it was a very joyous experience as an artist and writer working with such a brilliant filmmaker, Andy Delaney, to kind of collage all these clips and voices and material um, together to make that film. So now, for those of you who didn't know anything about Avram Stenzel, I, mean, I hope you know a little bit more 
about this amazing poet, and I'm sure you're very keen to hear some of the poetry itself. And it is my really great pleasure to have with us tonight uh, a, a very dear friend of, of mine, Stephen Watts, um, a poet who has lived in Whitechapel since the 1970s and remembers seeing Ovram Stanzel in local cafes in those years. Along with Dr. Barura Weingard, he has translated some of Stenzel's Berlin poems into a collection called All My Young Years. And he's working along with Barua, am I saying it right, um, to, to produce some of his Whitechapel poems. And his publisher, I believe, here from Francis Bootle is here tonight as well, so welcome. And to uh, bring the Yiddish to life, we are delighted to have with us here Dr. Libby Lax, who is a historian of the Jewish East End, a research fellow at Queen Mary University of London, and a Yiddish performer. Um, sorry, I just meant to say about some Stephen's work here. Um, is, is Hugh here? Hugh, Hugh Wall. Yeah, Hugh. Um, welcome. Hugh, Stephen, as I said, I've known Stephen for many, many years. He's a tremendous poet. His uh, collections include Ancient Sunlight and Republic of Dogs, Republic of Birds. But Hugh, who is connected to Manchester Metropolitan University, I understand, has made this extraordinary 16 milliliter, 16 mil black and white 70 minute feature film about Stephen and his work which is just um, exceptional. Anyway, so going back to uh, Vivi, uh, she's a historian of the Jewish East End, she's a research fellow at Queen Mary University, and she's also an amazing Yiddish performer and musician. She's the author of Whitechapel Noise, Jewish Immigrant Life in Yiddish Song and Verse, and London Yiddish Town, which is available here at a very special price for tonight. She's got a few copies of, of these books. Um, and Vizzy, Vivi also co-runs the Great Yiddish Parade and the Yiddish Open Mic Cafe in London, and leads tours, um, as do I, of the old Jewish East End. And she sings and records with the band, the, the Klezmer Club, so it's just Amazing to have them both here, and I'm going to hand over to Vivian Stephen. Whitechapel, Yerushalayim, the Britain. I just said a very, very quick word. I mean, it's incredibly moving for me to be here. And um, I do remember seeing Avram Stenzel in Whitechapel in the late 70s when I was very young. Um, in the first, uh, uh, we're going to read some of his Berlin period poems, which is from uh, this book, All My Young Years. But to start the, the, the poetry part of but you're reading, we thought we'd read one of his great Whitechapel poems, and I think you'll see why. Whitechapel Yerushalayim de Britain. Pumbedita, Korodva, Krakow, Amsterdam, Lublin, Volozhin, Vilna, Berdichev, Unkotsk. Shall male dicke vest bleiben wie eine von sei, mit horopaschnikes von Jitomer in Plotsk. Und oib der blutige Schliad unsere Azind nicht direkt erfiert bis vor dein offener Tier. Von Greuszar, du hast am meisten dir angetan. Bist du geblieben, afar blutiger in dir. Bedamayich chai, bedamayich chai. Du wirst noch leben bleibend mit dein letzten Eid. In minsten verscheuen und in vermischtsten scheuen, wie unteren Asch kliendig erglovnt 
Glück. Da hat Rosenfeld gesungen, ehrlich sein Lied, Winczewski gedient der jüdischen Wort getrei, wie unsere heilige Städtler vertilgte, schelmandig, du wirst bleiben, wie ins Wund sei. Whitechapel, der Jerusalem, der Briten, wirst bleiben, eingeliebt zwischen unsere Städte. Wie die Kudushim in der Heim auf Kiddush Hashem greit zu gehen letzte Jung geboren in Old Gate. White Chapel, Jerusalem, Britain. Pumpe Dieter Cordova Kakov. Amsterdam, Lublin, Boloshin, Vilna, Vedicev, and Kopsk. From on high, you remain there, one with them, with the laboring men of Zitomir and Plots. And if ours here now, this bloody, dirty lane, cannot lead straight to your wide, welcome doors, you will have taken your own life in grinding, pain, dying. Blood with courage with no good cause. In your blood you live and thus do you trick death. In the poorest of us and in those of us messed most. You will remain breathing down to your last breath. For under ashes and ember most strongly goes. It was here that Rosenfeld sang his other songs. And we just be loyally serve the Yiddish word. Among our holy shtetl towns, destroy things. From on high you remain here and still are heard. You white chapels, you Jerusalem of Britain, you remain embodied here in hometown walls, like martyrs back home, giving their martyrs. Last boy born in Old Gate still gives his all. Um, we're now going to read uh, four or five um, cancels, Berlin period poems. Um, all the translations that we should mention are um, by Gloria Vigant and a friend of mine and, and, and myself. And we're going to read in slightly different ways, one or two slightly playful ways. I hope it works. Schick ich mein Tfila zu bläuen Himmel. Schick ich mein Tfila zu bläuen Himmel, zu reinen Himmel. Du, was hast da so viel Bläu? Du, was hast da so viel Rein, Allmachtige? Was für euch hat deinem? Ist der ganze Gräu gar nicht geworden, so gar nicht, und wie kein Mal gar nicht gewähnt? Schenk ein Tropfen Bläu mir, schenk ein Rein mir, Allmachtige. Los mich in Atem deinem Neppel zerrissen, kein Mal, kein Mal gar nicht und kein Mal gar nicht gewähnt. I send my prayer. I send my prayer to the blue heaven, to the pure sky. You who have so much of blue. You who have so much of pure, almighty. Through one breath of yours, the whole grey is turned to nothing, nothing as if it never had been anything at all. Give to me a drop of blue, give to me a dash of pure, almighty one. Let me dissolve as mist inside your breath, never anything at all, and never having been anything either. Tanz ich a de Vekas tanz. Tanz ich hat de Wekes tanz in Schuhen von Umet, in Schuhen von Bittelhisch, 
von kalten, stillen Azovus, nehm ich mir zusammen und gehe an den Wegestanz, ach, ein Verrückter, ein Tanz, für den Abschied zum Aal, Chaul, Rim, ein Tanz, von Kohl, zum Mosai, zum Marle. I dance a God day's dance. I dance a God day's dance in hours of melancholy, in hours of self annihilation and cold, silent sadness. I put myself together and do a God clone dance, a little bliss dance, a dance of my soul thirsting for you, O oh God, a dance of all my bones will speak. I dance world into myself. My temples pulsing hot. I dance root entangled, wool embrambled, with tight clenched fists, holding inside the secret, the divine contraction, holding within me the secret, the divine contraction. And I dance with wide open, flaming eyes, with flayed out, wing wide arms. I dance towards beauty within beauty, towards God's holy. Shakina, a Hasidic world dance with an open, disheveled heart. A Hasidic circle dance. A God world dance. I dance with my God clung dance and an open, disheveled heart. A Hasidim rod, a Dveikas tanz, tanz ich mein Dveikas tanz mit zerrastet, offen heart. Hope you have bread. A very different point. I have bread. Hope you have bread. I have bread. A bed. A bed. A book to listen. A book to read. But someone to give away my heart to. I have. And when my heart is away, schenken, hope I not. Set sich mich offen bed and nieder. I sit on the bed in one hand a book. In one in one hand a book. Und zweiten Stück und Bräut und Kei und Lenz und Kai und Lenz und Kai und Lenz. Und wenn man soll ich das Herz wegschenken? Shall I run out to the street and somehow divine and guess who it is and tell him and ask him? Soll ich in Gaza rauslaufen und treffen und treffen, wenn man sieht und sagt ihm und bett ihn? Come with me. Come with me. Come with me. Quick, come with me. I have a bread. I have a bed. I have a book. And say, I have a pulse. I have a pulse. I have a heart. So come with me. Come with me. Come with me. Come with me. No, no. I have a doch dos and getroffen and gebeten. Geöffnet und geschenkt. Ah, oh, well, I used to, after all, and guess, and ask, and open, and go away. Nö, nö, ist blätterdicker mein Herz, ist ungeschriebener und fuller und fuller geworden. Ah, oh, well, my heart's become more leaf through, more written out, fuller or full. Nö, oh, well. nö. Hab ich ein Bräut, ein Bett, ein Buch? Und für morgen, und für die Nacht, und für alles, und für immer. Und morgen, und immer morgen, und ewig, und ewig. Leicht Turm. Ein gehendiger Winter im Mittagsum mit all ihren Spreisen als zerstrahlte, als euch seht euch der Lichtturm, euch geleuchten inmitten der Finsternis und das gesäderte Geräuschen und Schäumen ist das Zerrippen werden von die Kerne.
with lighthouse. A working windmill in the midday sun with all of its wooden spars flared out. This is what the lighthouse looks like lit up in the midst of the dark. And the constant sowing and foaming is the grain being crushed around. Und Erd, du, was bist du? Bist du der schwere Milchstein, Äpfel, unter welcher mir kommen nach unten? Und das Gesäderdicke schäumen und räuschen, das treiben sich unsere Almens Beine. Erd, du, aufgeleuchten. Mit alle unsere Lebens. And you, Earth, what are you? Just perhaps a heavy millstone beneath which we are ground. And the constant foaming and sowing, our bones all crushed together here. You, Earth, lit up all our lives. And a final short lyric poem. <laughs> In the white swan land. In the white swan land with outstretched swan neck, I fly, my last blessed be God bubbling out of me, leaving trembling ripple circles for a few moments of my wake. In the white swan land, my last prayer will die, my first prayer die with me, dissolved as bubbles in my marrow, rippled as small circles in my blood, in each drop separately. In the white swan land, my prayer will hover in the air, white breath in white skies. In the white swan land, wird bleiben mein viele a hängebicke, weißer heuch auf weißer Himmel. So before we break, I want to tell you a little bit about the Friends of Yiddish. Because what we've had is we've had that Stenzel would be the person in charge. And then we have him reading a poem. And then we have him reading some more of his poems. But there were other things that happened in the Friends of Yiddish. So at the beginning of every Friends of Yiddish, Yehuda is Sommer Liski would stand up, and Yehuda Yassam al was a, um, a communist, later socialist writer who wrote fantastically interesting stories about the East End. He was always called the young Liski, even when he was an old man. And uh, because he was young when he started, hey. So he would get up and he would speak about the politics of the week. So people would know what was happening in the wide world because they lived in the Yiddish shtetl of Whitechapel. And then after that, Stenzel would invite people to do things. And so he'd invite his favourite. And one of his favourites was Katie Brown, Gittel back on. And Katie Brown was his favourite. He called her London Yiddish's Yiddish bestseller. And she would write all sorts of little stories. So she'd get up and she was a little woman. And she was a little woman and she'd um, walk up and she wrote very funny stories, but she was very humble. And she'd stand there and she'd go, um, she'd give a little smile. And she'd say, Jewish readers, you're going to get this in English, okay. Newspapers are read by civilised people across the world. For some, reading a newspaper is a daily routine, like any other regular, everyday activity. Let's take, for example, the English. Every morning the trains and trams and, and buses are packed with workers, each one holding their own newspaper, engrossed in reading it with interest. Whether they're reading sports or politics or current affairs or theatre, readers sit quietly undisturbed by anyone so they can concentrate on the articles they're reading. The Jewish reader, however, is different. For example, a Jew is walking along, slowly along the street reading a newspaper he's just bought when a second Jew interrupts him and asks, is there any news in today's paper? There he is, the first one answers and kept walking. What is it then? Could you possibly describe? Please tell me, I'm curious to know. And she goes on with her funny story. And when she finishes, then maybe someone else gets up. He, he, he asks... 
maybe not his favourite person, the poet Itzik Manga, with whom he had uh, a big uh, argument, lots of broigus going on in this little community. And he stands up and he reads a poem about Yiddishkeit flying away and the feeling of pain and longing happening as you watch the golden peacock of Jewish culture move away. The melody was written a lot later. Mit vermachte Eugen hältst du nei unter dem Jahr. Mit Fieber und dicke Finger fielst du kringer dem Gram. Die goldene Pave, da kennst du ihn flieh. In a Bengschaft wäre es schöner, wenn sie es finden. In a Bengschaft wäre es schöner, wenn sie es so you get a sense that you've got all these different things coming up. And then you might have a special guest. You've got a special guest from Canada coming. We've got Chava Rosenfarb, the poet, coming from Canada, and she's reading her material. So you have a very vibrant sense of Yiddish land from abroad, from um, this wide Yiddish-speaking world that concentrates itself into this little space in the Jewish reading room in Whitechapel, and it's a small space crowded with people, and you'll hear a little bit more about that after the break. <laughs> Vivi, thank you so much, Stephen. That's just amazing to hear that work resonate in this uh, space in Yiddish and in English. We're going to have some more amazing poetry in English and translation from Vivi and Stephen now, where they're going to read some of the translations of Stenzel's Whitechapel poems, which have never been heard before, kind of pre-publication. Then Vivi is going to read from her amazing book, London Yiddish Town. Are there any copies left or have they all, they've all sold? But you can order it, speak to Vivi. And then there's going to be some song. We're going to hear from Miriam. And then I'm really looking forward to hearing all of you. So please give a warm welcome back to Stephen and Vivi. So as, as um, Rachel said, we're going to read a few of Spencer's uh, poems from the period when he had moved to a white chapel, therefore the period between 1936 and his death in 1993. Um, mainly we're going to read from a poem or a sequence called White Chapel Idyll, which is 15 sections long. Uh, we're just going to read five and I think Viv is going to Open the reading in Yiddish and close it in Yiddish. Teusenter Koimendlich auf die Dechlich Arim zieht es durch einem von unser Stiebel der Reuch, von dem Strick von die Flatter dicke Wäsch in Wind, winkt Foche dick, bakant, Windele von der Heuch. As es seinen deiner Eugen schwarz Pintel dick noch, ist doch als übrig nicht wichtig schon mehr. Oib in unser Städtel mir können nicht zurück öfter, wollen mir bringen zu uns do aher. Whitechapel Idyll, nein. Thousands of little chimneys on the roofs about smoke from our home must be from one of them. On the washing lines, wet ones flap in the wind, a familiar little nappy swaying against the sky. Because your eyes already are black glittering, nothing else seems as if it matters anymore. If we cannot go back to our own home shtetl, Maybe we can bring it here to where we are. 10. Mother's whispering lips I only saw when she lit the holy shopper's candles. I looked at them. 
at their quiet trembling, and even now I know and understand how God can be talked to. Was it my mama, or because I was then a child, that poor room filled with secret done in life? I can see him in your eyes, you teaching him how to speak with human lips to God. 11. Dark little courtyards and shadowed in dark, reflected in Shabbos calm the whole week long. Each tiny street is a lit up bridge like this. We'll go across it happily toward the Messiah. Our own heaven weaving itself onto the street with Kedusha and Bok, and then, Amen, accompanied by the joy song of the sewing feet, its three seamstresses and its dear little son. Twelve. A light-lipped tiny smile from my father's eyes, which then loses itself inside his thick beard. How beautiful his whole life in his lit face. I will find it when I'm old and full of years. In his religious books it was quietly hidden, with each grey hair placed between the pages, as if such hairy rootlets in lines of tilled soil could juice and mature it down all the ages. Fifteen. And if, God forbid, we'd run away from home like a needed shtetl and we'd take you off with us, as if from Poland, Lithuania, you white chapel, I rhythm sense the run rhyme move my feet. From the charnel pit as an unextinguished spark, a little shabby's candle leaves the house from here. We'll carry it somewhere far off with bare hands and bring it home before it wholly dies down. Und wenn Khalila läufen mir Wellen von du, wir Städtel von der Heim nehmen mir dich mit. Wie von Peulen, wie von Litter, weit Schäppel du, ich spür es freitig in dem Rhythm von meiner Schritt. Wie von Scheiterhäufen nicht verloschenem Funk. A Schabeslichtel von du, von a Stieber Reus. Mit unsere heule Hand es sie der Trocken, es a Heimse bringe noch eider es geit Reus. I think I wish we had read more of that. Two short lyric poems, which in a sense we wanted to read because they show a different side of um, Stenzel's White, White Chapel years. It's also just worth saying that his Berlin period poems were expressionistic and often didn't rhyme. His White Chapel poems tended to be more formal and did rhyme. The first one is Full Moon, and we're going to read these first in English and then in Yiddish so as to finish the poetry reading part of the evening with Yiddish. Full moon. The alley cats all wholly lose their minds from day long waiting for the sun to come. In the evenings when the full moons rise, they think it is the sun about to dawn. What's happening here in these little alleyways? The meow song in front of lintel steps and doors. And up on tiny roofs, the old ones stretching out, as if in hope of some warmth through the floors. Full of the <coughs> die cats, a ganzen tug in die gesslach du, von warten auf sin gehen schwer, a rop von sinnen, in oven, wenn die purple levone geht euch. Meinen Seis is scharen dicke Baginen, was tit sich durs ob da in die Gessler, das gesinnt gemjack wird von Tieren und Schwellen, und auf die Dächler leigen sich euch die Alte, wie auf Sinns wollten sich warmen Wellen. 
And I'd just like to say that in these poems, I'm actually doing it with a more, for the Whitechapel poems, with a more Polish accent. In the south of England, when the immigrants came to this country, it tended to be that those that came from Poland were more likely to go to London, and that those that came from Lita, Lithuania were more likely to come to the north of the country. Right? Um, Manchester was a bit mixed because there was a lot of Hasidim there as well. Um, so, hence the accent. Jasmine. All year when jasmine blossoms, such a sadness holds me in so tight. Is it the day's making aroma does this, or the sharp green on the lucid white? Does it remind me of love and then of death? Does it remind me everything must pass? The little branch of jasmine that you brought, I put standing at my window in a water glass. You fly off, but you'll soon enough be back. You don't fit in here, but don't know where to fit. Soul dipping into water and then drowning on such sharp green in such a lucid white. Alle jour, wenn es blit der Jasmin, nimmt as a treuerkeit mich arim. Ist es der dicke Geruch, die klare Weißkeit auf dem scharfen Grün, der Montes mich in Liebe, in Teut, der Montes mich als Alsting mit Vergehen, es zweigel Jasmin, wo es hast mir gebrängt, in Gloss Wasser auf mein Fenster seestein. Flatterst da weg und kimmst bald zurück, gehörst nicht da mehr und weißt nicht, wohin. An der Schume tut sich und trinkt sich als eine klare Weißkeit auf scharfen Grün. So now I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about Avram Nochem Stenzel, and mainly in his own words. And that is because Stenzel, in his Loschen and Leben, he didn't just produce poetry, he also wrote an editorial introduction, and they're absolutely fascinating. For a historian, what they give you in terms of his own personal experience and the more general um, historical feel of the time is, is really um, very fascinating, and something that is not necessarily found elsewhere. And you'll also hear some other people's words on this. So. There may be a bit of overlap, so it's always good to hear things twice. Yeah. There are competing anecdotes as to how the poet Avram Nochem Stenzel arrived in London. Yiddishist David Katz, who we saw earlier, who lived in London, lodging with um, Liskey, who was a writer, the young Liskey, during the 1970s, remembers that Stenzel and members of his inner circle would relate the story of how Stenzel escaped Berlin in 1936, crossing the border in a coffin. Katz also heard from Liskey, who was in Stenzel's outer circle, that the coffin story was a small incident at the beginning of his journey. The more likely version is that the Quaker Christabel Fowler facilitated his escape by inviting him to London to write an article about English art. Whether or not there is any basis to the coffin story, or whether it is a myth, is, it is worth repeating, because Stenzel became an important figure for the creation of Yiddish mythology, as he wrote his beloved Whitechapel into his poetry published in London. As soon as he arrived, Stenzel began producing his own poetry in pamphlets published by the Naroditsky Press, he also wrote for Die Zeit, the Jewish Times, although this part of his career did not have an auspicious beginning. I'm popping a lot. I don't know whether you can take it down a bit more. 
Yiddishist and tailor Maya Bogdansky recalled a story told to him by Stenzel that the first time he gave uh, Maurice Meyer a, tr a, a manuscript of a poem for publication in Die Zeit, Meyer took it away and improved it beyond all recognition. When Stenzel saw the result, he refused to allow its publication and demanded the manuscript back, but Meyer would not return it. Stenzel opened the window of his flat and yelled, Police! And Meyer capitulated. This incident did not seem to affect their ongoing relationship, and Meyer published many of Stenzel's poems in the site over the next decade. The most inspired and long-lasting of the regular literary events was the weekly Shabbos Noch Mittig, which was later called Shabbos Afternoons, later called the Friends of Yiddish. These gatherings, they began in 1938, and they were based on a similar literary circle in Berlin, where in 1936, the group had been inaugurated in a secret, in secret posing as an engagement party with Stenzel as the groom and his friend Dora Diamant, the actress, as his bride. In 1938, in London, no such care was needed, and encouraged by Diamant, Stenzel ran the London Shabbos Noch Mittigs in a, the Jewish reading room of the Jewish shelter at 63 Mansell Street in Whitechapel. It brought together writers and intellectuals who read their own work and that of others to an engaged and critical audience, including, you might have heard of Esther Kreitman, who was the sister of the Singer Brothers, uh, Bashevis Singer and his brother. Okay. On the 6th of September, 1940, Dietzite announced that the next day, the next day's Shabbos afternoon, Friends of Yiddish, would be the first of three lectures, this one by A.M. Fuchs who had escaped from Eastern Europe and was, it was actually the brother of Liskey. The first lecture would focus on Yiddish poetry in London and would look at um, uh, Moshe Ovid, uh, Malka Locker, and Avram Nochem Stenzel. At four o'clock on Saturday, the 7th of September, 1940, however, no one attended the lecture. The cancellation notice was provided by the roar of German bombers as the Blitz began pummeling southeast London and as the day moved on, reaching the East End. The Blitz over London ran for 57 consecutive days and nights, bringing all of East End activity to a virtual standstill, almost all. That same month, before Fuchs's talk could be rescheduled, Stenzel produced the first issue of a new monthly Yiddish literary journal, containing his own and about ten other London writers' contributions in poetry, prose, and essays relating to Yiddish literature. He did not have enough money to pay for producing the, the, the journal, which was not at that stage called the um, Loschen and Leben, they were, it was, oh, I think I'll tell you here, actually. It, it, they were called Heftels, which means pamphlet, and they got nicknamed Stenzel's Heftler, Stenzel's Pamphlets. He didn't have enough money to pay for the printing, and he recalls that this was during the first few days of the Blitz, when even Dietzeit has ceased publication for a few days. It was at a time when no one considered founding a new literary journal in Whitechapel. But the bombing of the East End was a spur because the Yiddish word needed to survive these dangerous streets. It was an hour before nightfall on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and Stenzel barely had time to grab the 5,000 copies and ran into the nearest shelter before the bombing began. Hundreds, thousands of people were sheltering there. In one corner, there were Orthodox Jews praying the New Year liturgy. And this is in Stenzel's words, danger hung over everyone's head. At that moment, how close people were to God and how my heart felt close to every Jew there. Yet it turned fantastical, if not fanatical. In that dreadful night, if I had had what 10,000 copies, I would have sold them all. All. Stenzel made enough to repay the loan and more. In yet another bombing raid, Stenzel's small room of Commercial Road and his whole street were completely destroyed. With it went all his books and papers, leaving him to live in a rest home for air raid victims, where he began writing poems about that very air raid. 
His friend and colleague, Joseph Leftwich, remembers how Stenzel refused to be bowed. He was undeterred in his mission to ensure that the Yiddish language was not bombed out of existence. And this is a quote from Leftwich um, in the Jewish Chronicle. Some will say that the man is mad to go on, heedless of everything that's happening around him and to himself, writing and printing and selling. He is his own bookseller, his poems and essays. The truth is, the man is possessed. No matter what is happening to him, there is nothing more important than to express himself in his beloved Yiddish. He is a fanatic, but it needs a fanatic to stick to his guns in spite of everything that happens. Now we move a little bit later. And we're moving to 1946 when the writer Hay Levick was on his way from New York to examine the situation for survivors in the DP camps in Germany. He stopped in London with time to walk through the debris of the East End to a Friends of Yiddish meeting. Levick described Yiddishkeit crying out from the ruins. On coming into the meeting, he was moved by the warmth of the dozens of people, many of them writers he had met on an earlier trip to London before the war. He wrote in his diary, the naked, lonely destiny of our literature here felt greater than loneliness. Every writer felt like an orphan. Levick, on his way to witness the devastation of the Holocaust wrought, was only too aware of the breaking continuity for every Jew who had once come from Eastern Europe. Yet Levick was staggered by Stenzel's commitment. This is a quote. It may thunder or lightning or throw bombs over London. He won't give up the time that they gather together. Under the effect of his stubbornness, a hundred people in the ruins of the East End. Yeah. A hundred people join him in the atmosphere of Yiddish language, Yiddish literature, and Yiddish song. Levick's visit coincided with the publication of the first issue, not of the Heftler, but of Loschen and Leben, where he changed its name. Stenzel described how he handed a copy to Levick, who held the copy of the journal in his hands and his face shone. But despite Stenzel's perception of his reaction, Levick remarked with gloom, that in all those 100 faces, there was not one young person. And he left feeling unable to be optimistic about Yiddish in London. But I'm going to end this with Stenzel's stubborn optimism. And this is a quote from Stenzel from 1943. If our blood is being sucked out of us, with as much as is left, we shall go on. Firm in the faith that the coming generation will not shame the past. And that the Yiddish literature that is being created in and about our epoch will be the expression of our conflict and pain and will contain the hope and the joy of being able to bear everything and to bring it to life. And if we're going to be inspired by Stenzel's words, to go and study Yiddish, or to read Yiddish translations, to honor his memory of saying that we are going to keep Yiddish alive. And I'm going to end completely with um, something completely different. This is a Yiddish music hall song. Now, in the Friends of Yiddish, they certainly had songs. Whether they really would have had a Yiddish music hall song from 1905, I don't know. But this song was collected by, we've heard him earlier, Derek Reed. And Derek Reed was a song collector, and he collected this in the 70s from a woman called Bertha Jackson, who was then 90 years old. She wasn't in London. She was in Liverpool. <laughs> And she heard this song in the musical. Either she did or her uncle did who taught it to her. 
I would like to say that if in Liverpool, in the small community that I was brought up in, um, it was a really like little Jewish community, then certainly if you have Music Hall there, you had it here in Manchester in the much bigger community. And this song is called Victoria Park. Now you've got to remember this is Music Hall, right? What are we going to expect? It's not the Yiddish theatre, it's below the Yiddish theatre. <laughs> If you think of the English music hall where you've got people crawling in windows and the lover crawling out and all sorts of shady deals going on, expect that. <laughs> so this is called Victoria Park and um, in Yiddish it's called Victoria Park. <laughs> so can we just have a quick try? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And um, it's... Uh, it's a song about what's going on in Victoria Park. Now, Victoria Park was just north of the East End, and it was okay on Shabbos. It was quite far, but it was like you could still walk there on Shabbos and play in the uh, stand pit for the kids and so on. And there are all sorts of people, and we see the, 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 the porter with a thick neck, and we see boys walking along, and one of them's falling over, and their teeth are falling out, and snot is coming out of their nose. It's musical, yeah? And um, we see um, a husband and wife going along together, and we see Chaita from Lita, Lithuania. She's the third, and she works uh, uh, in the city. Nudge, nudge, wing, wing. And then there's another couple, and they're lying about on the ground, and uh, he says, oh, come on, can't we get married? Can't we get married? And they got married in Victoria Park. So that's the sort of song you can expect. And I think that because this was written at a time when actually Yiddish was very vibrant, it may even have made Stenzel smile. Now, I need a hand with this song, right? <laughs> so you now know the lyrics, Victoria Park, yeah? So I'm going to sing, yeah, na, 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 na. you're going to sing, Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Then I'm going to sing, yeah, no, 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 you're going to sing, in Victoria Park. Got it? <laughs> London wird jetzt stark geläubt, Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Wer wollt du's gegläubt, in Victoria Park. A proste Garten, aber stark, Victoria Park. Victoria Park. A porter mit a groben kark in Victoria Park. Yet the Weine, it was the Beine, and fought of Steine, and verliert die Zeine. Er liegt in Chorpet, wenn der Gaus es kapet, man läuft fast ob it in Victoria Park. Jutke geht mit Rachel Zwock. Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Sie a in der Azok. In Victoria Park. Nachman Berge mit sein Weib. Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Landsleit sich ein dort a Job. In Victoria Park. Dort geht Chaita am Moin fin Litte. Sie ist die Dritte, sie wohnt in City. Herr Reuter Benny, die grobe Annie, gestippelte Fanny, in Victoria Park. Am Mädel sitzt sie und sie gehen Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Ich hasse will sie dort und sehen, in Victoria Park. Er liegt dort in groß Victoria Park, Victoria Park. Häufige Zeugen, wie er hat in Victoria Park. Er hat zum Bett, in Küchen in Glät. Wenn wir hier heiraten, wo es kann du schaden. Der Hossen ist ein Dicke und sie ist ein Schicke. Und sie haben beide Hossen, where? In Victoria Park. Ay, 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 ay. Vivi, <laughs> isn't she extraordinary? Don't you feel like you know Yiddish now? I just understood every single word of that song. Um, what an amazing evening. Now I want to kind of 
bring us out of Whitechapel a little bit and back to Manchester where we are. And um, I'm delighted, really delighted, can you hear me on this mic? Yeah. To have with me here Miriam, Miriam Becker, formerly Stenzel, who is Stenzel's great niece, correct? Miriam, what do you think he would think of this evening? Oh, he would love it. He would absolutely love it. He never cared about money. That wasn't an issue. The acknowledgement of other people and the furtherance of Yiddish, that was all he cared about. And this tribute, he would absolutely be thrilled. Oh, that's so lovely to hear. <laughs> really special to hear. I mean, one of the things about the Friends of Yiddish, obviously, is everything was in Yiddish. And I've spoken, Miriam has given so much of her time over the years to me to speak about her uncle. And I did ask you that question about what do you think he would think, I mean, we have heard Yiddish tonight, thanks to Vivi and other people. What do you think he would think about sharing this evening in English and Yiddish? Well, he avoided speaking in Yiddish, although we all know that he could understand it. Yeah. Um, but his whole purpose in life, I mean, Vivi said he was a fanatic, and he was, he was a fanatic. He was passionate about the furtherance of Yiddish. That was his whole raison d'etre. That was his whole reason for being. Absolutely. And Miriam, you yourself spoke on the film and a lot of people there, and we saw that lovely footage of him. He was a very charismatic mm. character. How would you describe the way he looked? He, was... well, he had very pale blue eyes, twinkly eyes, very charismatic. Um, but as I said, he was always scruffily dressed. Um, he Big overcoats with big pockets, pockets everywhere, all filled to the top. Um, always lost pens, lost everything because he was quite scruffy in his ways. But he, had, he, he would just pull out reams and reams of paper. And he was always scribbling, always had to add something to it or, or amend something. That was just what he always did. It was on his mind the whole time. And he used to come to your house in London, didn't he? And yes. He had a special relationship with your father. Oh, yes. Um, well, to explain, he was my grandfather's brother. Um, so his brother, yeah, so my father, my father's uncle, but there were only 10 years between them. And when my father came to London, I think he, he recently arrived, and the rest of the family, a few made it to Israel, but everyone else was killed in the Holocaust. So there was just the two of them together, and they were close. They, were, they spent a lot of time together, and they were close. But this was in the early days. I don't remember any of that, but I do remember him. He always used to turn up at our house unannounced, but always with a box of chocolates. <laughs> Um, and he used to pull out all the reams of paper from his pockets. Um, my father used to sit in a chair and listen as he read out all his poems. And my father was the one that corrected the grammar. You <laughs> <laughs> had a, a special relationship with him. You've got yeah. nice memories. Oh, yes. Yourself, I think um, possibly because he was aware that he was the only relative around. I had no grandparents. I was an only child. Um, my father became ill soon after I was born. He had Parkinson's, and, which degenerated over the years. So I think he probably felt that he should take me out. Um, and he used to take me to Westcliff, your home ground. Um, he loved going to Westcliff. He always tanned very easily, and we always knew he'd been there. <laughs> and he, he wasn't a religious man, but he knew that I had grown up in a religious house. So he used to take me around Westcliff and take me to a Jewish boarding house for lunch. And um, yeah, that was things he did for me. And he was interested in your education. Can you tell, do you mind telling the story about how he saw you off when you came yeah. to Manchester? Yeah, he did. He, he was always asking me how I was getting on at school. Um, I was actually at school in a state grammar school in Clapton, 
um, which is East London. Um, but in those days, although it was a grammar school, probably less, probably 5% continued to do A-levels. The majority um, at 16, after what was GCEs in those days, uh, went on to do secretarial courses. And I think my parents assumed that's what I would do. But I wanted to do A-levels, and being from a from family, they didn't think that was quite suitable for a from girl. So um, he came along and he told my parents that he thought I should be allowed to do it, which I did in the end. I got my A-levels and came to University of Manchester. Um, because my father was ill, my mother was unable to come with me to the station, so I went in a taxi. When I arrived at Euston, he was there to see me off. That's such, that's such and a he probably connection. thought that it was a big step in my life and I shouldn't be doing that on my own. And it was. And, and, it, and it, it was lovely, yes, it and was really been nice. Here ever since, and I have, had. yes, yes. So to have this in my hometown is just oh, wonderful. I haven't had to travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you, Mary. And, and I've really you. enjoyed it. I learn a lot about this because. Yeah. Although he used to come to our house quite often, yeah. um, it was different relationship. I didn't know his work, I didn't know all the things that he did. And I'm learning a lot about his life from things I hear here. That's wonderful. Yes. Well, can everyone just give a really big hand? <laughs> I open up to questions from the audience. There's another really lovely Manchester connection um, that's here with someone who Miriam and Roy actually met, Schloini Orman. So uh, I don't know if any of you saw this exhibition, but quite recently at the People's History Museum, there was an exhibition of photographs of Jewish Manchester by someone called Schloini Orman, who sadly is no longer with us. And in 2019, I went to uh, visit Shloimi, uh, who now lives in Israel, in a moshav just outside of Tel Aviv. And before he made Aliyah, emigrated to Israel, in the 1970s, Shloimi was born and grew up in the Cheatham Hill area of Manchester, and his parents were <coughs> Polish Jews. And his uncle, his uncle's son is here tonight. Um, so I'm very delighted to welcome him here. And Schleimi, uh, there's a lovely connection with Stenzel and Schleimi. So before Schleimi left for Israel, he took, he wasn't a photographer, but he took a series of photographs of Cheatham Hill, of the Jewish life in Cheatham Hill, including your uncle's barbershop, and told me these amazing stories um, about your uncle who had this extensive Yiddish library in Cheatham Hill above his barber shop, and he would welcome the Yiddish uh, theatre players from London when they came uh, to visit Manchester, which was fantastic to hear these stories. And Schleimer's Polish Jewish parents were huge fans of stencils. And his father used to write sometimes for Losh and Laban. And his mother came down to one of the Friends of Yiddish meetings um, in the 70s and sang. Um, so there was this lovely connection. And when Shloimi's parents died, he wrote to Stenzel and said, can I come and meet you? And Stenzel took him for a tour around the Jewish East Stand. And the first place he took him to was his favorite place, which is Bevis Mark Synagogue, which is the oldest Sephardic synagogue actually in the UK, which looks very much like this one, bigger and grander. So it's a lovely connection. And after taking this walk with um, Stenzel, Schleuny took this amazing series of photographs. So we had an exhibition in London and an exhibition uh, in Manchester. So it's a, again, it's a very nice connection between Manchester. I don't know if you, if you want to share any memories of your uncle. Well, yeah. Shlomi was a, 
because of my father. So my father was uh, part of a, a kind of barber dynasty, <laughs> as well as uh, ladies' tailors. So the Almond was the original Polish name, but it was anglicised for Almond so people wouldn't turn up to get a suit measured and have a haircut instead. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for sharing that story. And I mean, surely, uh, before he died, he spoke to me a lot about his memories of growing up as a Polish immigrant, Yiddish speaking, in Manchester, and going to visit the little the Jewish delis that used to be all around this area. And he was uh, a child, a Yiddish speaking child in the 50s and all the shopkeepers loved him because there wasn't many people in the community speaking Yiddish at that time in Manchester so he always got a little bit of sausage or a little bit of cucumber um, they'd give him all the, the, the choice food um, I don't know if there's anyone else in the audience that's got memories to share of Jewish Manchester yeah. No thanks Liz um, I, I'm, I'm too a, a Miriam <laughs> Um, I, I'm really pleased that I, I didn't know about Stenzel, I'll be absolutely honest. Um, I'm sat here remembering, I did an MA in Yiddish in the year 2002. It had to be at London University. Um, my lecturer was Helen Beer, Chaya Beer. I was inspired by David Katz, who was on my thing. Um, I then came back to Manchester, round about that time, knocking on Bill Williams' door and Don Ranger back in the day saying, where's your Yiddish? And there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot. So Don um, pointed me towards the Manchester archives um, and we found some penny dreadfuls in Yiddish. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry to hear that I didn't, make, didn't meet your uncle. I was desperately looking for a Yiddish circle for a friend of Yiddish and we set up informally for one year <clears throat> at the late, I don't know if anybody remembers, Sholem Goldblatt, who was a native Yiddish speaker, um, religious, Zionist, a very rare person. We hosted for one year a weekly session in Yiddish. It was all free. Um, his late wife, uh, Ruth, would, would uh, do their, their hosting. We couldn't get people to come. We had four people on a weekly basis. So I'm really delighted that there is a renewal. I hope people, um, I, I kind of, I won't say I lost my way, but I did, because I was looking for a Yiddish-speaking community and I didn't want to go towards the Orthodox one, I ended up doing my MA thesis on the Yiddish-speaking community of Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not, believe it or not, they come from a tiny shtetl in Poland. It's a fascinating story. And that's where I go to speak my Yiddish. Yeah, Central America, that's where you're going to find it. Uh, Manchester, I'm, I'm a bit hard pressed. Uh, just from a personal point of view, my grandfather was born in Sfat in Israel, very orthodox family, came to Manchester, opened a factory um, down here, down Derby Street, and in the 50s had non-Jewish workers and he actually trained them in Yiddish. So there are, I've, I've always had a, a, a want one day, but as time goes by, I don't think it's gonna happen to find these workers who were trained fully in Yiddish on how to make raincoats. And I cannot, no, this is, this is a true story, absolutely true story. I can't find, so I'm delighted that there is an evening. I hope, and you always look for the younger faces, and I'm, I'm moving up in age. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have a younger generation doing Yiddish. Manchester doesn't have, I'll be honest, I can't. When I was really intense on this, I didn't find much. Um, it would be great to, to see a revival. Thank you so much for sharing that, and please don't leave without saying goodbye. <laughs> um, we're, we're nearly running out of time. Is there anyone else that would like to share? Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I've been involved with the museum since it opened in 1984 as a volunteer. Um, with my husband and my mother, we used to perform in this performance space, and my mother sang in Yiddish. Um, I have her voice um, on tape, I have her recordings, and I currently perform as a volunteer singer in the Jewish old age homes, and my plan is to memorise my mother's songs 
and then to perform them. So I'm currently performing in Hebrew for um, Jewish audiences in the old age homes and in English, and, but I am planning to present uh, my mother's songs in Yiddish. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like this is going to be the beginning of a long conversation. And please, if you're interested in future events and sharing these stories, don't leave without um, telling these stories. Um, we're very nearly finished. I actually want to end with a story that seems very poignant tonight. So, as Miriam said about her great uncle and her father. They were the only ones from their Polish family that survived. I've got some of members of my own Polish family here. And I always remember my father saying to me about a story that was told to him by his Polish Jewish father and his mother particularly lost most of her family during the Holocaust, and about coming to the UK and being welcomed as an immigrant to this country and saying how he could walk down the street without having a brick thrown at the back of his head, which is quite a mild form of what was happening for Jewish people during that time. And I think to bring that back to Stenzel and his passion for Yiddish and how powerfully he felt that this language of these Eastern European Jews should not die with that community, but also just celebrating being in the UK and our Queen allowing people to live here like our grandparents and, and celebrate. So I think I'd just like to end on that note and thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you. Chapel, mein Weitschapel, der Kennen kennt ich die nicht mehr, die bis gewöhnt im Londoniden's Glanz.